In my last lecture, I noted that the College Board pretty much skips over the 300 years of European history that are represented on this slide, with one big exception. And what exception is that? The map gives you a big hint, by the way. Well, one of the invasions depicted on the map was the Muslim invasion of Spain, which established the splendid Umayyad Caliphate centered in Cordoba. Remember these works? But with the exception of Muslim Spain and some brief cultural flourishings in Celtic Britain and Ireland, Charlemagne's France, and the early Ottonian Empire, the years 700 to 1000 were not great times for Europe or European art. Invasions, disease, and depopulation of once flourishing Roman towns left most Europeans huddled under castles for protection and, frankly, exploitation, living at bare subsistence levels. But around the middle of the 11th century, things look up for the people of Western Europe. We're going to focus on two major religious and artistic features of this period, the increasing importance of pilgrimage and the rise of the great monastic orders. But first, I should note that non-art historians are more likely to name population growth as the most important development of this period. The population of England, for example, is thought to have almost quintupled in the Romanesque era, from around 1 million to around 5 million people. Why this population explosion? Well, Europe got a break from the plague. As the graph indicates, it would come back in the 14th century with a vengeance. The Viking raids slowed down, and one group of Viking invaders, the Normans, settled in Western Europe and multiplied fruitfully. These are the folks who created the Bayou Tapestry, which we looked at last class. Iron plows opened more land for cultivation. Germans settled the Slavic hinterland, and all through Europe, people cleared forests and grew more crops. More food meant more people, a lot more people. Together, these developments began to transform feudalism. At the end of the Roman Empire, urban centers had lost most of their population or disappeared altogether. Now medieval Europeans flocked to towns. For one thing, any serf who could manage to stay in town for a year and a day without getting captured by his lord became a free man. Money also returned to the economy in this period. People, in other words, didn't just barter or exchange for goods. As more town dwellers had money to build churches, craft guilds began to compete with monasteries as producers of religious art. Pilgrimage played an important role in reviving towns and in reviving the traditions of Roman architecture and monumental stone sculpture. So, let's turn now to the first part of an excellent video on Romanesque cathedrals. Pay special attention to the role played by relics. Remember, the ECB will often ask you to relate the architecture of sacred spaces to religious beliefs and practices. As we just saw, Romanesque churches were designed to accommodate pilgrimage, but the great Romanesque churches were also, for the most part, monastic abbeys rather than diocesan cathedrals. To understand their form and function, you need to know something about monasticism as well. So let's continue with the video. And now we move to our only required work for today, admittedly one that comes with four required images. Since I pick on the College Board a lot, let me note that it's a great relief to focus on just one Romanesque pilgrimage church and not try to guess which one will show up on the test, and that I really like the one they picked, the Church of Santa Foy in Conques, France. I've circled the town on the map. As you can see, the church is on one of the popular routes leading to Santiago de Compostela, the Cathedral of St. James in Spain. And now, you get a break from my disembodied voice and get to hear a genuine expert talk about this church. We'll start with this explanation of why Conk and its patron saint were so important to pilgrims. Take notes into your workbook, especially when he talks about the reliquary statue, which is one of the four required images from this church. I thought an especially fun detail was the different origins and materials of the head and the body. Also, and you can come back to this after you watch the clip, why does our lecturer call this reliquary statue a living work? And it might be interesting to compare this with some of our African and Pacific works. So, 
Now that you've watched that long video clip, let me recap just a little before we move on to look at the tympanum. The floor plan of the Church of Santa Foy is not one of our required images for some reason, but I think the floor plan makes it easier to see how the Basilican church design evolved to address the needs of pilgrimage. The radiating chapels, which you see here in pink, held relics, and the ambulatory made it easier for pilgrims to get to the relics without disturbing the monks during their many services. The transept was now quite wide to accommodate crowds, and the church architect even added a transept exit more crowd control. The interior photo on the right, which is a required image, reveals a nave with only two levels, although the apse has three. The nave is covered with a rounded arch barrel vault defined by a series of transverse arches, the most characteristic feature of Romanesque churches. Rather oddly, the College Board's required image doesn't show the series of transverse arches. It cuts the photo off too soon. I think this photo is clearer. The bottom level with the arched openings is the arcade. The upper level where women would be seated and pilgrims may have slept is the gallery. In late Romanesque and Gothic churches like Chartres, this will flatten out and become a decorative triforium rather than a space for holding additional worshipers. Note that in this church, only the apse has a layer of clarity windows. The nave does not. This is a more generic Romanesque plan, but I'm including it to share a few more important terms. The choir in pale yellow is the space between the transept and the apse. The choir, the altar would be in the apse. This area is often a step or two higher than the nave. It's called the choir because traditionally the clergy of the cathedral stood here as a chorus chanting or singing during the responsive portion of the mass. But what I really want you to notice is the crossing, that deeper green square where the transept intersects the nave. The crossing square, which would be set apart by massive arches and piers, is the basic geometric unit of the Romanesque church, and this is something our expert didn't talk about. Each bay of the nave, that is, each section between the piers, would be exactly one half of the crossing square. Each aisle bay measures exactly one quarter of the crossing square. Remember that builders lacked our modern day measuring tools, so this geometric organization helped ensure that the building was uniform and symmetrical, while also enabling the builders to expand their plan by adding additional squares. In other words, this is an early and very important form of modular construction. So here's a photo of the Church of St. Foy's crossing square topped by a cupola. Uh, the photo on the right is not one of our required images of this church. The image on the left is, but I've included it because the photo shows the cupola over the crossing square and it gives you a clearer view of the semicircular apse and the radiating chapels that held the relics. Notice also from the required image those westwork towers which add to the verticality of the space. And here's an interior view of the ambulatory. One of the ways Romanesque church architects supported the heavy barrel vault stone ceilings was by using buttresses. In Romanesque churches, as these buttresses were usually, at least in early Romanesque churches, I should say, were usually engaged stone columns, that is, columns attached to the church wall. I've circled one here in red. We will see more spectacular unattached buttresses, well, or at least not totally attached as columns, in our next lesson and next church. To hold up those heavy stone vaulted ceilings, Romanesque master builders also used these heavy compound piers. Here's still another view of Santa Foy's nave and a diagram that offers more detail about a compound pier. I do not think you need to know all these terms, but you should recognize the term compound pier. Another feature that sets Romanesque churches apart is the use of historiated capitals or column capitals uh, that don't follow one of the traditional classical orders like Corinthians, but instead include sculptures that tell a narrative. Now your workbook says we're going to skip this part of the video. I changed my mind, mostly because this fall I visited a Romanesque abbey in Tuscany and it had wonderful historiated capitals and I just couldn't bear to leave them out. This is not a required image either, but it does tell the story of Santa Foy, so I'm going to have you continue the video just for a minute or so here. Okay, this is our final required work from the Church of Santa Foy. In the past, AP questions about Romanesque art have tended to focus on the tympanum. Why? Well, in part because the elaborate tympanum sculptures that decorated the entryway to most Romanesque churches were carved in stone. 
given our breakneck race through Christian art, you may not have even noticed, but monumental stone sculpture basically disappeared from European art for more than 500 years, from the late Roman Empire to the era of Romanesque pilgrimage churches. Also, no depiction of Christ is more iconic of Romanesque art than Christ as the final judge of all human beings. Our expert will explain why and give us a wonderful close-up tour of this complex sculpture. We've included many of these images in your workbook, so lots of note-taking opportunities, right? This is a very detailed, more than you really need to know, but the wealth of messages captures the religious and artistic spirit of the Romanesque age.